Well, hi. How are we doing today, Father's House? We're doing good? Hey, can we say hi to all of our locations, our Prison Church Network, people tuning in? Amazing. Well, you can be seated in here this afternoon. It's good to see everybody in church today. And uh, I'm excited to get to preach. We've had a great morning so far, and I believe God's going to speak to us today. Uh, I get to preach on part three of the series we've been doing called Unoffended, Living Under the Commanded Blessing of God. And we say this every week, but especially in this series, these messages really are building upon each other. So if you didn't get a chance to listen to Pastor Dave's message a few weeks ago, he talked about what offense is and how it comes in our life. And then Pastor Joseph last week preached an amazing message on offense with God. What happens when life doesn't measure up to our expectations? And today uh, I get to preach on offense with authority. Um. It was a great week for me to preach on this. Uh, I was assigned this topic today, and uh, I'm really excited to see what God speaks to us. Uh, I'm, I'm preaching out of the life of King Saul today, and so if you would pray with me one last time over the preaching of God's word. Jesus, we thank you so much. Uh, we gather here today, Lord God, to hear from you. And we're thankful, Lord, both that your word is alive and well and that your spirit is in this room. And so because of that, God, we are trusting that we will see you more clearly. Jesus, we know that, that changes everything. So we ask you to do that in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, human beings, we're funny creatures because every year we get older and we think that because of that, we're just getting over the things that have happened to us. But uh, if you're like me, every once in a while, something will pop up and it will transport me in a time machine, like immediately back to a certain age. And this happened not that long ago to me where I was instantly transported back to being a middle school student, okay? And I have a lot of grace for our middle school students in our youth ministry because I swear to you that I was in the running for most awkward middle schooler on planet Earth when I was in middle school, okay? And I remember one Halloween, um, I got this idea in my head with my group of friends. I don't know where it came from. I'm going to assume it was demonic, where we thought that it would be a good idea. My youth pastor was bald, and we thought it would be a good idea for Halloween for us to shave our heads and dress up as him, Okay. Yeah, now, I, my wife hates this story, by the way, so I told it to the service, and she was, like, in the front row dying. Um, you know, so I, uh, I don't mean, like, get a buzz cut. I mean, like, I already had a buzz cut, and then I went to my dad's bathroom and got out, like, his Gillette Mach 3 razor and just, like, went to town on my head, okay? And I remember looking in the mirror and being like, huh, um... And then I walked out and my mom looked at me and you know it's bad when like your kind, loving mother is like, huh. <laughs> and so it, the story only gets worse. Like the next day I went to school and all of my friends that said they were gonna do this with me, none of them did it, okay? <laughs> yeah. And the story gets even worse. Uh, and you know, typical middle school relationship fashion, the girl that I was into told her friend to tell one of my friends, to tell one of my friends, to tell their uncle, you know, to tell whoever that because of my new hairstyle, she was no longer into me. <laughs> it's heartbreak warfare, okay, as a child. And here's the thing, I like to say, you know, I was, been over 20 years since I was in middle school, but a few years back when like everyone was getting buzz cuts and I thought about doing it, like something inside of me was like danger, danger, red flag, no, don't do that. You know, because you guys think I'm vain, that's why I grow up my hair. I'm not vain, I'm traumatized, that's why my hair is long all the time. You know, and I think it's funny, you know, there's things in life, this is not a really big deal about funny things like haircuts, but this afternoon I want to ask you the question of what else in your life is your experience informing? Here's the truth, is that unfortunately the way that life works, we talked about this week in week one of the series, is that there is going to be pain and there is going to be offense in this life. And today we're talking about a specific kind of pain that can leave a unique mark on us, and it's this. We're talking about pain that we have experienced from those who should have been in our lives to nurture and encourage us. But for a variety of reasons, they drop the ball. And this could be pastors, this could be mentors, this could be bosses and managers, could be a coach, or it could even be your earthly mother and father, right? We all walked in here with a family story. My mom used to say that if you stare at anybody's family long enough, they all belong on Jerry Springer. <laughs> so whatever the reason why you have pain, we've walked in here together. 
And I, I thought this week of maybe some categories of that pain. I think it's important. Not all pain is created equal. And so maybe one or, or a couple of these relate to you. The first one would be the pain of real mistreatment. There are people in this room and you have actually experienced abuse or neglect because of a leader's sin. And can I just tell you today, if that's your story walking in here, I'm sorry. No, like really, I'm sorry. Like that shouldn't have happened. It's not okay. And I can't apologize as that person to you, but I'll try to apologize for them. I'm sorry that that's the story that you walked in here with. Um, Pastors are people, we've made mistakes, we drop the ball, and my goal is just to apologize as quickly as possible when I do that. But just like in your profession, there are some bad apples. 99% are great people, but there's some bad apples. And so if that's your story today, I'm sorry. And that's a real thing. I never thought church hurt was real until I was really hurt by the church. <laughs> the second category I thought about this week is this, the, the pain of indifference. You weren't the choice for the job, for the promotion. You, for whatever reason, weren't the guy or the gal that was on the inner circle. And that's painful. One of the hardest things I've walked through is earlier in my life, I had a little bit of falling out with my first youth pastor. And after a few years, I worked up the courage and the humility to reach out to them and called them on the phone. And I was hoping we were going to have this like, come to Jesus, kumbaya, I'm so sorry as well type moment. And our phone conversation essentially ended with, hey man, I never really felt that way about you. <laughs> Can I tell you, that's not the conversation I was looking for. Like, I would have rather had it be like, yeah, I have hated you for the last decade, right? At least we could have moved forward with that. But that's just a part of life that we're not always the chosen one. We're not always the gold star person. We're not always the person that has that happen in our lives. Another category I thought would be the pain of misunderstanding. That something you said or a mistake that you made was interpreted in a certain way and it led to broken relationship. And finally, I thought about the pain of abandonment. Transition is a normal part of life. People change jobs. People get called by God to go somewhere new. But that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt when it happens. This has happened to you before, but I was a youth pastor for eight years in Florida, and my phone does this thing where it's like, hey, remember this? And I'm like, I wasn't planning on remembering that today, but thank you. And, you know, a picture came up this last week of, you know, us with our youth ministry. And I, it kind of hurt a little bit. Like, I know God called me and my wife to do something new, but there's a little bit of pain we feel, right? And, and those four categories, in no way, I'm, there could, I'm sure I could spend the rest of the message talking about other categories. But I say that to say, in this room today, all of us have experienced pain. We've been let down. And our question is this, what are we going to do with it? I, I can't change that it happened to you. I'm sorry that it did, but how will we move forward from here? What will we do from here? And today, we're gonna look at someone named Saul in the Bible. Now, Saul's story spans many chapters in the Bible, and we unfortunately don't have time today to go through all of it, but Saul was the first king of Israel. What's fascinating is that God never actually intended for Israel to have an earthly king. The way that he set it up is that there was going to be a prophet who was appointed that would hear the voice of the Lord, and then God himself would go out in front of Israel when they would fight in battle. Now, the people started saying this thing generation by generation, which was, give us a king so we can be like every other nation around us. That's a dangerous prayer to pray. God, I want to look like everyone else. God, I want to talk like everyone else. God, I want to do this the way that everybody else does it. God, in his grace, answered their prayer. And so Saul is cho chosen to be king. Now, Saul is the person that when you looked at him, he looked like a king. The Bible says that he stood head and shoulders above his peers, both in the way that he looked and the way that he led. The unfortunate thing is Saul does many great things for God. We see God use him mightily in the beginning of his life. But there is this key red flag. There's this key fracture in who he is as a person that will eventually be his undoing. And it is this, that Saul had a crippling fear of man. Even on the day that he is anointed, it says that when he should have been in front of everyone, he gets found hiding among the baggage. He's trying not to be seen. 
And unfortunately, as Saul's life continues on, this thing that was a little fracture, this thing that he could have worked through, ends up being the very reason that he is taken out and rejected by God. And it finally culminates in 1 Samuel chapter 15. God specifically tells Saul and the army, he says, when you conquer this nation, he says, keep none of the spoils, keep none of the gold, keep none of the silver, keep none of the livestock, but sacrifice them all. Saul chooses not to listen. And so God sends the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and he says this. Has the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. And it says this, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Can I encourage you in something today? After two weeks of study and prayer, the one thing that I am sure of from Saul's story is this. When the fear of God disappears from a person's life, people will be hurt in the process. When the fear of God disappears from a person's life or never existed to begin with, people will be hurt in the process. Can I encourage you? Can I pull back the curtain a little bit for you? You have found yourself in a church full of pastors and leaders that fear God. And that's an important thing. When I stand upon this stage, I don't take it lightly. I don't get up and say, yeah, that's right, I'm preaching. I understand that there is a crazy thing going on where a broken person like myself gets to speak the word of the Lord to our church. I don't take it lightly that your giving is what pays my salary. I don't take it lightly when we put together a church budget that there are people that gave out of their poverty, that gave out of hard times. So when we sit around in a budget meeting, we take it seriously. We don't spend money frivolously. We say, hey, and it's not because I'm afraid of you, it's because I fear God. Because that's not my money. This is not a business, that's God's money. And when that disappears from a leader's life, people get hurt in the process. Whether that's a pastor, a mentor, a boss, a coach, the only thing that will allow us to continue on in community is if we say, God, it's not just about these people that are counting on me, it's that there is a greater judge that sees all. And unfortunately, Saul loses that in his life. And he fears man more than he fears God. And as a result of that, in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, a new king is raised up named David. Now David is maybe the most well-known person in the Bible outside of Jesus and Moses. He is the most famous king of Israel. He wrote a lot of the Psalms. He's one of the main characters of the Bible. And in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, immediately following his rejection of Saul, the prophet Samuel gets told to go anoint a new king. And if, if Saul was the tall, good-looking guy that looked like he should have been king, David is the exact opposite. David doesn't even get invited to the anointing party. He shows up on the scene and he says, do you have no more sons in this? And they go, yeah, there's like the little one. He's out with the sheep. <laughs> and it says that God says something to him. He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And he's anointed king on that day. And can I tell you, the anointing represents the tangible presence of God that was upon David's life. Same as for David, when the anointing is upon your life, elevation begins to happen. It does not mean that life is always up and to the right. There's some bumps along the way, but those that are anointed are elevated in the kingdom. And so what that looks like for David's life is he gets called into the inner courts of the king as a musician. What it looks like is he becomes best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. What it looks like is one of the most famous stories in the Bible of him conquering Goliath. What it looks like is him becoming the strongest general in the military. And what it finally culminates in is him marrying the king's daughter. Because of Saul's fear of man, what you will always see is that people that fear men are afraid of anointed people. People who are insecure are afraid of who God has placed their hand upon. Secure leaders can handle talented, anointed people around them. Insecure people that fear men more than they fear God are trying to push down and push away those that God is elevating. 
And so what happens in this story is that Saul and David's relationship gets fractured. Finally, it culminates in this. It says, and there was war again in 1 Samuel chapter 19. And David went out and fought the Philistines and he won again. He struck them with a great blow. So they fled before him. And then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with a spear in his hand. And David was playing the liar. He's like, I'm just trying to play Wonderwall and like get this guy to chill out, okay? Like, it says, and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with his spear so that he struck his spear into the wall. David eluded him and he fled and escaped that night. And from here on out, while Saul is on the earth, David is running for his life from him. And today our primary text that we will look at comes in 1 Samuel chapter 24. As David is on the run for years and years, it says this, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. And that means what you think it means. It says, now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So these guys that are on the run are hiding out in a cave and in trots King Saul, not paying attention with no soldiers with him. And they're all sitting here hitting themselves being like, David, this is it. Like, he doesn't know that we're here. We just happen to be in this cave. I'm tired of living in a cave. Let's kill him and move back to the capital. What we see is David sneaks up closer to him and it says that he cuts off a corner of his robe. Now that may not seem like that big of a deal to us today, but something very specific is happening in this passage. See, the kingly garment that Saul was wearing, more so than a crown that we would maybe think of, that kingly garment, that robe represented that he was king. The second thing was that the state of that robe, being in good condition, not being tarnished, is what allowed Saul to go into the tabernacle, to go into God's presence. So in one move, what David has done is said, you are no longer the rightful king, and two, you do not, no longer are you in God's presence. Notice in this passage that his friends tell him, you should go and kill this guy. Be very careful when you are living in pain and you are living in hurt of whose voice you let speak into your life. You will be shocked when you are having people that it becomes an echo chamber, a group of broken, bitter people that no longer speak, speak for God, but speak for themselves. And they tell him, Yo, you should go kill him because we're tired of living here. In verse 5, something amazing happens after David does. It says, afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is God's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. David has his heart changed because of his behavior. You know, the most common way that David is described in the Old Testament was that he was a man after God's own heart. And you know what I think is fascinating about this story is that it's not in the palace, it's not when things are going good, do I believe that David became the man after God's own heart. It is not in the ease of the palace, the ease of being a king, but it's in the desperation in the cave where you decide if you are a person after God's own heart. It's easy in these moments for us to, when things are good, to say, I'm not bitter. I have forgiven. I, I'm no longer holding on to those things. But what about when the heat gets turned up in your life a little bit? What about when you are challenged? What about when you do feel that pang or that pain when that person's name gets brought up? What will you do then? And I do believe this today that our question of how we can do that is very simple. It's look to Jesus. Today, it's what is not going to be helpful is for me to give you a five-point message on how to forgive people better. 
What is extremely helpful is for you to catch a revelation of the cross. Think about Jesus. <laughs> because the Bible says that on the night before he is betrayed by one of his best friends, he is, rather than defending himself, rather than being on the run, is sitting there, waiting for it to happen. He is eventually brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling class of the time. And it says that he is silent before his accusers. Imagine the irony of the creator of the universe, the one that the book of Revelation says that at the end of time, he will judge the living and the dead, standing in a seat of judgment, being judged by people that he created. Think about Pilate, a Roman political pawn pronouncing death upon Jesus when a chapter before he said, if I wanted to call down a legion of angels right now, I could do it. And finally, think about on the cross that he stays silent before his accusers, that prophet Isaiah said that he would be like a sheep before its shearers, silent. And it says that the only words that he speaks is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So when I remember some of the ways I've been hurt by people, when I am reminded of some of the bumps and bruises I've had along the way, my goal is not to say, oh God, I'm just gonna muster this up and I'm just such a great person. It's Jesus, if you could stay silent, I can probably stay silent. It's Jesus, if you said forgive them for they know not what they do, then I can probably forgive them as well. And all of it will boil down to one specific thing. So David calls out to Saul and he says, my father, my king. He says, I could have killed you. He says, God put you in my hand. He says, God brought you to me. You were in the cave. We could have taken you out and no one would have even known. But in verse 12, he says this, may the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But what? My hand shall not be against you. See, the way that you handle those who have hurt you will speak deeply to your belief in the sovereignty of God. Listen, I, I'm not pro-pain. I'm not pro-neglect. I'm not pro-abuse. I'm not pro any of the things that have happened to you, but I absolutely am pro the sovereignty of God. And what I want to tell you is I've been around long enough in ministry to notice, to observe, to see it happen again and again that those who live from the flesh, those who do not fear God eventually end up alone. And so the reason why I believe that, the reason why it's an anchor for my soul is that I don't have to be a part of what happens in this person's life. That when something erupts inside of me and I want to expose them or their name gets brought up and I want to say, yeah, they're actually not that great of a person. When that erupts inside of me, I just have to say, God, unfortunately, I know how this story ends up. And I just believe that you're a righteous judge. and I just believe in your sovereignty. And so because of that, I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm going to choose to pray for them. And when the inevitable thing falls to the ground, I'm going to keep praying for them. So what David tells Saul is not that, hey, Saul, it's going to be all good. You're going to stay king. He says, God might strike you down, but he said, it will not be because of my hand. To tell you all of that, right, it sounds really good, right? Like in here, it's like, oh, yeah, it's easy to forgive John. But our question for us today is, what do we do with this tension, right? That we're all probably on this journey of I've had some pain happen to me. I've had some things that have hurt happen to me. And I feel like I'm supposed to forgive, but I'm not quite there yet. I heard it said this way, and I, I really do believe it to be true, that the only way that David didn't become Saul was because of Saul. I heard it said this way this week, thank you, God, for giving me a Saul so I don't become one. And I've had every kind of leader in my life, some amazing ones, some ones that hurt me along the way. And I'm just here to tell you, all of them have made me more like Jesus. I wish that there was another way, but all of them have been a part of my process of trying to lead like Jesus, trying to act like Jesus, trying to be like Jesus. 
So today, I want to talk just for the minutes that we have left together about what are the things that I notice in my life that show me I'm becoming Saul. The first one today I want to talk about is I become Saul in my speech. The words of my mouth are the fruit of my heart. The book of Proverbs would say it this way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, or for us, out of the abundance of the heart, the fingers tweet. (laughs) It's an election week joke for you today, okay? Um, Let it speak to you if it needs to. But what's fascinating that I'd never noticed in this story before is that from the moment that Saul throws a spear at David, do you know that he never uses his name again? In fact, four times he calls him either directly to him or to other people about him, says, you son of Jesse. Now, why does that matter? Well, because in the Old Testament, a name was the substance of a person's identity. And do you know what the Hebrew word David means? It means beloved of God. What a point for us today that when bitterness begins to take over my heart, I stop being able to see people as God's beloved. My speech begins to change about them. I begin to slander these people. When someone in a group is talking about how awesome that person is, I feel like I have to speak up and say, well, actually, they did this to me. And what it reveals is that something crazy and something evil is happening inside of my heart that I can't even speak that God is beloved. And that begins to cloud my vision because what it will do is put me in the place of being the righteous one and everyone else doesn't get it. (laughs) What that does is that, oh, I did nothing wrong in that situation. It was all them. They're all evil. They're not the beloved of God. Rather than the mature position saying, I probably contributed to this a little bit. And when you begin to speak like that, isolation will always happen in your life. See, because when you talk crazy enough, people start being like, man, that guy's a little bit out there. (laughs) Saul does this enough times that people are like, dude, this is your son-in-law. Like, does it enough times to say, this guy has fought armed battles for you, and we see Saul's circle begin to isolate. Can I tell you, you and I get weird when we're alone. When no one can speak into my reality, when no one can say, hey, man, I I don't think you're fully seeing the full picture, you'll begin to get weird. (laughs) The second way that I see Saul coming alive in my life is that I become Saul in my outlook. The way that I see the world, bitterness twists it, it clouds it, it, it changes my ability to see how things truly are and what could happen. Although it's really rough that Saul chased David, that Saul threw a spear at David, it's actually not even close to the worst thing that he does in First in Samuel. In fact, at one point, this anointed, this leader of Israel, because this group of priests helped King David, Saul shows up on the scene and kills 50 of them. Now, that seems crazy, and the reason why it does is because his outlook had been clouded. People The priests did not even go to battle. The priests' entire job was to lead the nation in worship, and Saul has now started to see them as enemies. Why? Because when you get alone and bitterness has taken over your heart, everyone is against you. I start seeing enemies all around me. I start thinking I got haters everywhere. You don't have haters. No one even cares about it. (laughs) Honestly, for us today, half the time I think people are talking about me, they don't even know who I am. Like, I start seeing, the proverb says it like this, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous stand bold as a lion. And can I tell you today, when you live life like that long enough, what you start to live out is what I call self-fulfilling prophecy, which is you speak things out and then you make sure that they happen. You start saying things like, yep, I'll never trust a pastor again. Yeah, If you don't come to church and meet a pastor, that's probably true. (laughs) Well, you know, because of that breakup, I'll, I'll never be able to trust someone in a relationship again. Yes, if you never get in a relationship again, you're right. And this is what the beauty of the church is, is that we walk in here with all of our brokenness, all of our pain, I'm messed up, you're messed up, and we all come to worship at the altar of a holy God. 
We all come in here. And so because of that, pain is not a possibility. It's a definite. So what are we going to do with that? How are we going to solve this thing that says, I have been hurt? The only thing I can stand upon is I was hurt by them, but I won't be hurt by everyone. I can't change what happened, but I can begin to open up my heart to trust again. And can I tell you, that's my family's story. That's why we're here. Like, I came into this season with some bumps and some bruises, with some things saying, yeah, I'm having a pretty hard time right now trusting leaders. And then we looked at the people that were offering us jobs and we said, okay, I feel like I could maybe trust this family and I feel like I could maybe trust the father's house. And I'm thankful for people like Pastor Dave and Pastor Mark and that said, hey, just come be here and you're gonna heal slowly. And after six or seven months, I, I start being like, yeah, maybe I am a son here. And I start saying, Pastor Dave, I don't think you wanted a stepson, but you got one, okay? I, <laughs> I start saying, you know, Joseph, Tosh, Jude, Sir, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm coming to the holiday because you didn't invite me, but I got nowhere else to go, so hi, I'm here. <laughs> no, there's a beautiful thing in the kingdom of God that what we begin to say is, this is the family I was given, but there's a family I can choose. And just because I was not given the father that I deserved, I can get a new father. And just because I was not given the pastor that I deserved, I can get a new pastor. And just because I did not have the mentor that I deserved, I can get a new mentor. God begins to heal our hearts and a new story begins to be written. I'm going to invite the keys up as we begin to close down our message today. See, the third and final stage of becoming Saul is this. I become Saul to my children. Saul's life is a Greek tragedy. The man who was anointed king, the man that should have led Israel into prosperity, the man that stood head and shoulders above his peers, the man that should have ruled from the mountaintop, dies alone on a hill. And what's wild is that he does not just die by himself, his sons die with him. First Samuel chapter 31, it says, now the Philistines were fighting against Israel and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and they fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul. The archers found him, he was badly wounded by the archers. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword, thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. Thus Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men on the same day together. Can I talk to you for a minute about something, church? And it's this. I hear something spoken a lot in the years I've pastored people and it sounds something like this. You know, I went through pain, I went through hurts, but this is like kind of my thing to bear and like this is just gonna die with me. What that sounds like is, you know, I, I was hurt by a pastor, and so we're not really church people, but you know, my kids, they can make their own decision about God. And that sounds really good to you, but what that reality is today is this, your children don't grow up in the house of God. What that sounds like in our hearts is, you know, we went through that divorce, we went through that breakup, and you know, men cannot be trusted, but my daughters, they can make their own decisions about what they think about this, not realizing that what you are speaking with your life is passing pain onto your children. What that sounds like is, well, you know, that one pastor, he didn't use the money correctly, and so because of that, we don't give, we don't get behind these things. And you think that what you're creating is a world where they can make their own decision, but your life is declaring these people cannot be trusted. 
book of Psalms says it this way, that one generation will declare God's good works unto the next. But my friend, just like you can declare God's good works unto the next generation, you can declare death over the next generation. And on a day like this, can I just tell you, it's not your fault what happened. I'm not here to say that that was right. I know that there's people that walked into our church today and because of what you're carrying, it's even hard to lift your hands during worship and it's painful. But as a father, can I tell you today, if there's no other reason you forgive and lay this at the altar, do it for them. If there's no other reason that you begin to say, I could trust again, do it for them. Because as a youth pastor going on 15 years, can I just tell you, this is not a made up idea in my head. And I know today that there are people in this room that it's painful for you to be here, that you were really hurt and I'm sorry. I'm not here to minimize it. I'm not here to say it was your fault. But what I am here to say is that God wants to write a new story. I got a vision this week of some people in our church and there's people in here and you're holding on for dear life by yourself. You're here by yourself. You're saying, there's no one in my family that goes to church. My husband doesn't come to church. My wife doesn't come to church and I'm hurting and I'm broken and it's hard for me to worship, but God, I'm gonna just come. Like, I I just gotta be here. If you want this, then you can have it. And can I speak to those people for a moment? You're writing a new story, because here's what will happen. You came to church by yourself, but after you, a new generation will arise. And the words of their mouth, the testimony of their lips will be, my parents showed up to a church they saw off the freeway in Vacaville, California, and they found God, and because of that, I grew up in youth ministry, and it it shifted my life, and it changed things, and come on, I'm here to tell you, after them, another generation will rise up, and they'll begin to say, yep, my grandma was in church, my grandpa was in church, my parents were in church, I've been in church my entire life. And a new story is being written. A new dawn is coming. The night is over. The sun has come. And God is writing something new. But the only way that happens is if you would be so bold today to say, God, it hurts. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But God, if there's no other reason, I'm gonna lay it at your feet. I prophesied today, there's church grandmas and church grandpas in this room. <laughs> there's people that your entire family's story is gonna be rewritten. As you stand to your feet this afternoon, we're gonna close this message with two simple questions. The first one in here is, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and you'd like to have one, today is your day. You're the whole reason why we got here, the whole reason why we prayed this week is today is your day of salvation. If I was to sit down with you in the cafe afterwards and ask you if you had a relationship with God, if your answer was anything else but yes, 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 then today is your day and this is your moment. So that everybody's heads bowed and everybody's eyes closed. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three, put your hands up. Okay, I'm gonna start in the risers today. I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. My middle section, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. I see your hand. I'm now moving to your right and my left. I see your hands in the back. I see that entire family, that's beautiful. God's doing something new. I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. Now I'm in the farthest section. I see you two in the back. I see you there on the far right. It's beautiful. I'm going to move to the floor now. I see you right here. 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 I see you two in the back. I see you guys right here. And I see you over here on this side. We're going to pray a prayer together. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, come into my life. 
make me brand new. Forgive me my past and give me hope for my future as I make you the Lord of my life for the rest of my life. Jesus, we thank you right now that your word says that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has come, the, old, the new has come, and the old has passed away. Lord, I believe right now because of that, salvation has entered into these homes, Lord God, that it's a new day today. Lord, new favor, new prosperity, new abundance, new life has entered into these homes, and we thank you for it. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, as we conclude today, our pastoral team and some amazing prayer team are going to be up here. Can I just encourage you, don't rush off to your car. Don't rush off to that lunch reservation. If you walked in here broken, you could walk out healed. You could walk out, if you came in here heavy, you could walk out light. I felt like God was speaking to you today. Just make your way forward. And if not, we love you. We'll see you next week in Father's house.